We need to pray, um, so if you are able to, please uh, join me now in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word, and we ask that, Lord, you would make it clear to us. And Lord, that we would hear you through these words written so long ago that seem so foreign. Uh, would you speak to us and would you show us your son, Jesus Christ? Would you pour out your spirit on us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This stuff is weird, right? Um, there's a lot of weird stuff going on. If, you, if this is your first time at Stockholm Baptist Church, welcome. Um, you must be thinking, what have I walked into today? Um, there's all kinds of stuff about weird diseases, there's stuff about... Uh, uh, women being on their periods, there's stuff about reproductive fluids, uh, there's all this stuff about all these animals you can't eat. Um, yeah, w w what's going on? Uh, those of us who are Christians, if, if we're honest, we, we often struggle with the, the book of Leviticus, and we struggle because so often the book of Leviticus feels irrelevant, right? And, and this passage is one of those passages that seemed very irrelevant, right? Right, don't lie, during the reading you drifted off a few times and, and got back in. Cause, not just because it's long, and it's by far the longest <laughs> we've ever done or probably ever will do, um, but also because it just seems like it's so unrelated to our lives. Right? We, we don't quite know what to do with all these laws about being clean and unclean. It, it feels like it's got nothing to do with us. It seems like it's purposeless. And yet, uh, as Nate was reminding us, it isn't. It's God's word. Uh, it's God speaking to us today. And these chapters, Leviticus 11 to 15, are written to help us understand what it looks like for us who are broken people and live in a broken world to draw near to a God who is perfect. That's what these chapters are about. They're, they're teaching us what it looks like for us who are broken people and live in a broken world to draw near to a God who is perfect. And so, in order to understand that, we're just going to ask three questions. Um, firstly, why is it important to be clean? All these laws about clean and unclean, why is it even important to be clean? Secondly, what does it mean to be clean? Or what does it mean to be unclean? And then thirdly, how can we be made clean? So firstly then, why is it important for us to be clean? All the stuff about being clean, why is it important? Uh, if we want to understand that, we have to go back to what we saw last week with uh, Freddie. Uh, Freddie was walking us through the chapters before and how God established this priesthood, right? And everything was going wonderful until two of Aaron's sons, they go into the sanctuary and they do something that God did not command and God kills them. And in the immediate aftermath of that, God warns Aaron, and he speaks to him. This is now chapter 10, verse 10 and 11 of chapter 10. God speaks to Aaron, and he says this, You are to distinguish between the holy and the common, and between the unclean and the clean, and you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. If Israel wants to approach God, which is what Leviticus is about, they need to be able to distinguish between two sets of things. Between, on the one hand, what's holy and what is common, but also they need to distinguish between what is clean and what is unclean. Now, we're going to deal with holy and common in a few weeks. Let's set that aside. These chapters are dealing with distinguishing between what is clean and unclean. That's what these chapters are about. And the reason why it's important to be clean is that if Israel wanted to be in God's presence, they needed to be clean. If you were not clean, you could not approach God. Let me give you an example. So chapter 12, verse 4, it says this. It's talking about childbirth. Then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purifying. She shall not touch anything holy, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are complete. We'll talk about why that's unclean in a second, but here's the point. If you were unclean, you couldn't go before God. If you were unclean, you couldn't be in the sanctuary. The reason why it was important to be clean is so that you could be in God's presence. And already, just even with that, we learn something very important. Um, these laws about uncleanness, they deal with all kinds of issues, right? What you eat, what house you live in, your clothes, what's happening in your bedroom. 
And it was teaching the Israelites that there was no sacred secular divide. In other words, what I mean by that is, there was no divide between their religious life and their work life. The, the things to do with God and the things that just to do with them. There was no divide between Sunday and Monday to Saturday. No, as they went through their lives, the whole time they're thinking about what it looks like to be in God's presence. Right? So as they're eating food, they're thinking, how will this relate to how I stand before God? As they're in their house, how will this relate? What's happening in their houses, how will this relate? They were being taught that in one sense, God is at the center of all of life. That there is a God-centeredness to life. These laws about cleanness and uncleanness meant that God was at the forefront of their minds. Right? They were always thinking about what the implications were for their time with God. The Gentiles... You know, the non-Israelites, they did whatever they wanted to, right? But the Israelites were constantly to think about what the implications were for life in God's presence. And you know what? Lots has changed. That's still true. God is at the center of our lives. God cares about what happens today on Sunday, and he cares about what happens through the rest of our week. He cares about what happens at work. He, he cares about what's happening at school. Right? So that, as the New Testament would say, whether we eat or drink, or whatever we do, we must do it to the glory of God. That, that's one of the things that these laws about being clean and unclean were teaching the Israelites, that life was all about God, and the reason why you had to be clean was so that you could be in God's presence. But that raises the, the, the big question, what does it mean to be clean? Or maybe to put it the other way, what does it mean to be unclean? Because there's all these laws and they deal with food, houses, reproductive fluids. What, what's the connection? What does it mean to be unclean? Well, again, remember, the reason you had to be clean was so that you could be in God's presence. And the idea of God's presence goes all the way back to the very beginning of our Bible, through the Garden of Eden. Right? So, so stick with me here. Remember, God creates this world and the world is perfect. And in the middle of this perfect world, he makes this garden, Eden. And this Eden is paradise. It's absolutely perfect. Everything as it should be. Everything whole. Nothing is broken. But of course, Genesis 3, our first parents, they sinned. They are exiled from the presence of God. There's two angels, the cherubim. They guard the entrance. And they're exiled into a world that is broken. Now the world doesn't work the way it was meant to. Now weeds grow from the ground. Nothing works the way it's meant to. Everything is out of order. There is disorder in our world. And the reason why I say that is because the tent of meeting, right, which Leviticus is all about, is meant to be a return to Eden. Right? It's meant to be a return to this presence of God. That's why there's a curtain that marks off the Holy of Holies, the, the most central part of the tent, and on that curtain there are cherubim. Right? Um, on, on that curtain, there are cherubim. Just like there are cherubim at the entrance to the cherubim at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. Right? The, the tent of meeting that's in the presence of the Israelites is meant to be a return back to Eden, the presence of God. And where God is, there is perfection. Where God is, there is wholeness. Where God is, there is no brokenness. And what that meant is that anything that symbolized dysfunction, disorder, death could not be brought near to the tent of meeting. Right? This was meant to be like a new Eden. And that's what these laws are all about. These laws about being clean and unclean are telling us that unclean things are things that in one way or the other symbolize the brokenness of this world. Unclean things were things that were uneden like Right? Things that weren't, it wasn't a picture of the world as God designed it to be. These things that are unclean, therefore, it's not about sin. I, I, I can't stress that enough. These things weren't sinful. Childbirth isn't sinful. It's a great blessing in the Bible. Nothing sinful about it. Most of these things here in, in these passages, there's absolutely nothing sinful about them. Right? Pigs are not particularly sinful animals. Right? It's not about being sinful, right? But each of those things, each of these things, they symbolize something about the brokenness of this world, and they were to be separated from the presence of God, which is meant to represent and be a picture of wholeness and perfection. That's the basic idea, but 
Stick with me. Let's maybe do a few examples so you, you get what I'm saying. Look with me from verse 9 of chapter 11. God says this, These you may eat of all that are in the waters. Everything in the waters that has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, you may eat. But anything in the seas or the rivers that does not have fins and scales, of the swarming creatures in the waters and of the living creatures that are in the waters, is detestable to you. You shall regard them as detestable. You shall not eat any of their flesh, and you shall detest their carcasses. Everything in the waters that does not have fins and scales is detestable to you. So Leviticus says you can eat animals that live in the water. Great. But if an animal lives in the water, it, sh it should be a fish, right? That's what you're expecting. What do fish have? They have fins and scales. That's what's normative. What's normal is that you expect fish, whether small fish, big fish, they have fins and scales. Except, in the water there are animals that don't quite fit. They're not normal. Because they live in the water, but they don't have fish and scales. In one sense, they're a symbol of the fact that things are not quite in order. Right? Things are mixed. The, the world isn't as it's meant to be. And so therefore, those animals that lived in the water that you expect to look like fish, but don't look like fish, they're unclean. That, that's why if you're an ancient Israelite, you, you couldn't go to the local Chinese and get that king prawn fried rice, right? Because prawns live in the water, but they don't have fins and scales, right? They're weird. It's a picture of the brokenness of this world. What are they doing in the water? And so they're unclean, right? Because they're not normative. And so they symbolize some kind of disorder. Similar kind of thing with the, the land animals. The expectation is, if you're a land animal, you've got these feet, they're split in two, you've got those split feet, and you chew the cud. In other words, you regurgitate your food, like, like a cow. That's the normal expectation. Except there's some animals that don't do that. That's weird. It's a picture, again, of dysfunction. And so those animals are unclean. And you go through the example and example and example, and all of these things symbolize brokenness in some sense. Skin disease, mold, dead stuff, all of those things are unclean. And it might be you're like, okay, cool. I hear you on that, Yannick. But what's all this stuff about, you know, being on your period, reproductive fluids, childbirth, what's going on here? Remember, Leviticus 17 teaches us something really important, and it's important for the whole book of Leviticus. The life of the animal is in the blood. Blood represents life. And so any bleeding symbolized death. The idea is that you are losing life, right? And so anything that involved bleeding was unclean. It was a picture of death. That's why a woman who was on a period was unclean. That's why childbirth, because of the amount of blood, that's why you were unclean. The same kind of thing with the reproductive fluids. These are kind of life-giving fluids, and you're losing those fluids. It's a picture of death. Right? And I know that seems weird to us, really, really weird to us, but it wasn't weird to them. The things that were unclean, in some sense, symbolized, right, in that world, in that culture, things that were not in order, things that represented death, things that were not Eden-like. Okay, quick aside here. This is very much an aside. I was very encouraged, as I was reading, to read uh, chapter 13, uh, verse 40 and 41. It says this, if a man's hair falls out from his head, he is bald. He is clean. And if a man's hair falls out from his forehead, he has baldness of the forehead, he is clean. Somehow baldness isn't a picture of this uncleanness. Pray, you know, praise God. And my brother, this is a quick word to my brothers, be encouraged, right? You're clean, right? It, it's, and my brothers that are hanging on unnecessarily, you, you don't need to hang on, Right? Uh, it looks like brokenness. It's not. It's normal. It's fine. Right? That, that's a word to, to, to you. Anyways, that's the point, right? Uncleanness, things that are unclean, they represent brokenness. And in one sense, they're constant reminders to the Israelites that they lived in a broken world. They were constant reminders to the Israelites that this world was not as it was meant to be. We sometimes forget that we make peace with this world as if this world is as it was meant to be. But these laws about being unclean reminded the Israelites that this world is broken. It is seriously broken. These laws reminded them of the brokenness of this world. And if they were to go to the temple, to the tent of meeting, they had to avoid these things that were unclean because uncleanness is contagious. 
If they weren't careful, they would make the sanctuary itself unclean. If you touched things that were unclean, you became unclean. If you ate things that were unclean, you became unclean. You could make the tent of meeting unclean. This uncleanness is contagious. That's why if you had certain diseases, you had to go outside of the camp, right? This is the original lockdown, the original isolation, right? You had to go away because uncleanness is contagious. And the danger is that they would make the tent of meeting God's place unclean and God would not be able to dwell with his people anymore. Uncleanness, what is it? It represents the brokenness of this world and it's contagious. And so if Israel wanted to deal, to live with God, they had to deal with this issue of uncleanness. And so that leads us to our third question. How do they become clean? Remember, if you're an Israelite, if you read through those laws, you're constantly becoming unclean. Just the everyday life makes you unclean. How do you become clean? Well, you typically... If you, were, if you were made unclean, what you had to do is you had to wait for a while. Sometimes you would have to wait for an evening. If you were bleeding, you would have to wait for the bleeding to stop. And then normally you would go to the temple and you would offer some kind of purification offering. Similar kind of thing with leprosy. You couldn't go to God until you were clean. And then when you were clean, you would come and you would offer an offering and then you would be pronounced clean. And yet what this means is, is that if the reason that's making you unclean persists, as long as it persists, you cannot come into the sanctuary. If you were a leper and your leprosy wasn't healed, as long as you were a leper, you couldn't come into the sanctuary. If you were a woman who was just constantly bleeding, you couldn't come into the sanctuary. At Leviticus 15, 25, it says this, If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. She's not sinful, she's not done anything wrong, she's not disobeyed God's commands, and yet... She cannot come before God. And Leviticus is teaching, if you want to be clean, you, you, you have to make yourself clean before you then come into God's presence. And I say all of that for this reason. That the way in which we have become clean today has changed. We, we still live in a broken world. Our lives are still broken. Society is still broken. Our lives are messy. Our bodies don't work perfectly. Our family situations are often quite messy. They're, they're not normative in that sense. And that means ordinarily, our brokenness isn't compatible with God's presence. And yet there's good news because there is a new way in which God makes us clean. Right? Leviticus says, if you want to go to God's presence, you have to be clean because God's presence rep represents wholeness and perfection. And yet, a little over 2,000 years ago, something quite amazing happens. God himself comes into an unclean world. God himself lives in an unclean world. And he enters into the messiness and the brokenness of this world. And he walks around this world and he doesn't avoid things that are unclean. In fact, quite the opposite. Again and again, if you read the gospel, he keeps meeting people that are unclean. You might say Leviticus 11 to 15 is background reading for the Gospels. Because what you see is, again and again, Jesus meets people that are unclean. Right? There's one time Jesus meets this guy who, the Bible says, has a legion of unclean spirits in him. Not that, not just that. He lives in tombs, which is also situated by a herd of pigs. If you've read Leviticus 11 to 15, that's like triple unclean. This guy is maximally unclean. You can't get more unclean. But Jesus doesn't avoid people like this guy. Jesus meets them. But he doesn't just meet them, Jesus heals them. We read that Jesus meets a, heal, uh, a leper and he heals him. The Bible tells us Jesus meets a woman with an issue of blood, just like what Leviticus 15 was talking about. And he heals her, right? But he doesn't just heal them. It's more he touches them. He touches them. Now, if you've read Leviticus 11 to 15, and you see those moments when Jesus touches the leper, or when Jesus raises that dead girl and he, he touches her, or when the, the woman with the issue of the blood, she, she touches the hem of his garment, you're, you're, you're reading that and you're like, no, no, 
Because what's going to happen? They're going to make Jesus unclean. God's coming to the world, and they're going to make him unclean. Now, uncleanness is contagious. You touch something that's unclean, you become unclean. So you're watching it, you're, you're dismayed. And yet the Gospels tell us something quite remarkable. Because when Jesus touches people that are unclean, they should make him unclean. But the Bible says the opposite happens, right? Instead of their uncleanness making him unclean, his cleanness makes them clean, right? When God encounters this uncleanness, that uncleanness should defile him. It should make him unclean. But that's not what happens. Instead, instead, or you expect at least that they would face some kind of instant judgment. But instead, these people that touch Jesus, they are made clean. When the uncleanness of people meets with the cleanness of God, the, the messiness, the brokenness of people collides with the wholeness and perfection of God, God's wholeness, his perfection, overcomes their uncleanness. That's what the gospel tells you again and again. Maybe let me put it a different way. It's when the death of people encounters the life of God, God's life somehow overcomes their death. It is as if Jesus is so full of life, so full of wholeness, that he overcomes our brokenness. Right? He overcomes our death. Each time he touches someone unclean, he overcomes their uncleanness with his cleanness. And look, that's amazing. That's incredible. We, we can shout about that. That's great. But that's just a dress rehearsal. Because on that Friday, on a hill far away, on an old rugged cross, Jesus took on all of the brokenness of this world. He took on all of the uncleanness of this world. All of that is placed on him. So much so that he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because all the uncleanness is on him. And he experiences, to an infinite degree, the pain of the separation that our uncleanness causes between us and God. He experiences it there on the cross. He takes it on and it kills him. It puts him in the tomb. On the Saturday, his body is lying dead and lifeless. And it's like the darkness swallows up the life. The, the brokenness of the world is as if it conquers. Uncleanness looks like it's won. Like sin has won. Death has swallowed up the author of life. And yet you don't have to have been in church for a long time to know that's not the end of the story. Right? Because early on the, that Sunday morning... Women go to look for the body of Jesus Christ, but they don't find a dead body of Jesus Christ. They meet some angels, and the angels tell these women, he is not here, he is risen. And he's risen because the, the grave can't hold him, right? Darkness cannot overcome him. Death could not swallow him. In fact, he swallows death. He rises from the dead. He's God. He's this great redeemer. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He wins. He overcomes. And he rises again because the life of God is stronger than our death. The wholeness of God is stronger than all the brokenness of this world or a thousand different worlds, right? All of that is no match for the power of God. Yes, he dies, but he dies to rise again. Leviticus teaches you, if you want to come to God, you need to become clean. You need to be clean and then come to God. But the gospel tells us something more profound. God has come to us. And he has come to us in our uncleanness and our brokenness and our messiness and he takes it all on the cross. He takes our sin, that's the reason for all of that. He takes it and he dies. And on the third day he rises again and he defeats it. He, he defeats all our uncleanliness. He breaks all our brokenness. Jesus makes us clean. And if you want to know the proof of that, the proof of that is that Jesus, having come and lived in this unclean world, and having taken it upon himself and died on that Friday, and having risen again on that Sunday, and conquering all death and brokenness and uncleanness, the proof is that he ascends into heaven. And when he ascends into heaven, he pours out his spirit. And he puts his spirit in his people. And he turns his people into temples of the living God. Right? He, he makes his people, the, the holy of holies, they become the place where God dwells. Right? If you're a Christian this morning, you are a walking temple. You yourself are a holy of holies. God himself dwells in you. Not because your life isn't messy. Not because your life is all pretty and put together. But because Jesus has conquered uncleanness. 
He's conquered it in the resurrection and he has poured out his spirit on us so that God might live in us. We can praise God because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and through his spirit. Jesus makes us clean. And, and I want to speak to you particularly if you're here this morning and you think you are too broken to come to God. You think you are too unclean to come to God. And maybe that's because of your sin, but you know what? Maybe that's just because your life is messy. You come to church, you look around, you talk to people, and everyone's life just seems so put together. Right? Their, their life seems so whole. Their, their family life, got these perfect nuclear families, mom and dad present, all of that. It, it seems like it's, it's perfect. They've got their job situation sorted out. They, they've not got anything on their criminal records. They've got good jobs. They seem to have good relationships with friends and with family. They, they don't use bad language. They seem, it looks, you come here, you think Christians are so ordered. And you think maybe you can't be Christian, you can't come to God because you won't be able to fit in. You think maybe that you are too unclean or too broken for God. Christianity is all about God. It's all about Jesus Christ. And Jesus is not afraid of our mess. Jesus came into our mess. Jesus took on our mess because Jesus is a great redeemer. And he's able to redeem all the mess in your life because he rose again to defeat it all. You cannot be too messy for God. You cannot be too messy for God. It doesn't matter what your situation is. It doesn't matter how broken your life seems to be. You cannot be too messy for God. Your messiness is no competition for his ability to clean. Your ability, your, your brokenness is no competition for his ability to redeem. This Jesus Christ, no matter how broken your situation is, you can come to Jesus Christ, and you can come to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ has already come to you. God himself has come. None of that stuff matters. Jesus is able to make you clean. And with all your messiness and all your uncleanness, as you come before God, and if you make contact with Jesus, if you look to Jesus, as you encounter Jesus, his cleanliness will make you clean. If you would touch him, Right? If you would look to him, if you would believe in him, if you would reach out and touch him, he will make you clean. He will make you his. And it won't be like all the mess in your life will just disappear. But none of that will matter because he will make you a temple of the living God. And on the day when he returns to make this whole world clean, you will live and dwell with him forever. If you're here this morning, you think you're, you're too messy for God, your life is too messy for God, come to Jesus Christ because Jesus makes us clean. Please, speak to me, speak to Nate, speak, speak to someone. The, the good news that Leviticus is ultimately pointing us to is Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the one who makes us clean. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you. Um, Lord, we thank you because you have done for us what we could never do for ourselves. Lord, we are sinners, and that means we cannot come before you. But Lord, even just the brokenness of our lives, it doesn't match with you. We're messy people. We have messy histories. Our lives, they're not ordered the way they ought to be. We thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into such a messy world like this. And all that disorder and all that dysfunction, he took it upon himself so that we could dwell with you forever. Thank you, Lord, for making us clean. And Lord, if there is any of us this morning who is still far off, especially if they feel that they're too unclean for you, Lord, would you grant them faith? Oh, Lord, like that woman 2,000 years ago, if only I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made clean. Lord, I pray you would grant faith that if only they would reach out to you that you will make them clean and that you will bring them into your presence. We ask for this grace now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, we'll have a short time of reflection. I'm going to ask the youth and those helping with the youth, you guys can head up and then, and then we'll join in singing.